Hello and welcome to Entypedia. Today we are presenting the first subject of the Encyclopedia, a walkthrough of the history of cryptography from its first steps till World War I. Come with us. Nowadays, cryptography can be found everywhere in our world. Everyday actions like receiving or making a call from a mobile telephone, paying with a credit or debit card, withdrawing money from an ATM or logging on to a computer with a password, for example, use techniques based on this science. When did mankind invent these techniques? And when did societies begin to use them? How were they first used? I recall that the answer is found in the origin of writing. That's right Bob, writing is, according to many, the most important invention of humankind. Writing renders proof of events, opinions, ideas and so on, across time and space, while helping knowledge to progress and civilizations to advance. However, when writing developed and had become generalized, the danger of others reading the texts was acknowledged and thus, the first systems to protect writing were invented. Right. Usually, the information that is being protected is referred to as plain text, and when the information has been encrypted, we talk about ciphertext, only the recipient, who possesses the information called cryptographic key or key, can reveal the encrypted information. We would have to go back to the 5th century BC, to Sparta, to see the first methodical ciphered system, it consisted of a cylinder, with a strip of leather wound, around it, like a bandage, and a message written on it. The unwound strip, would look like, a long string of letters, without any meaning, but when the recipient wound the strip around the cylinder, of the same size as the first one, the message would be decrypted, the diameter of the cylinder, therefore, was the key. The Skytail method was used by the government officials of Sparta to communicate with their military officers. It was not until a couple of centuries later that another popular encryption method arises, the Caesar cipher, named after Julius Caesar. It consisted in replacing each letter in the text by another letter, three positions down the alphabet, that is, replacing the A with a D the B would become an E, and so on, until the end of the alphabet where X, Y and Z would be replaced by A, E and C respectively. Both methods, the Skytail and the Caesar, are examples of the two main cipher methods, transposition and substitution. The transposition technique consists of shifting the position of the letters in the text following a certain pattern. This way, the cipher text has the same letters as the plain text, but with permuted positions, these encryption methods are called transposition or permutation ciphers, and the previously described Skytail would be an example of this. The substitution methods, on the other hand, maintain the position of the letters in the text, but their appearance changes, that is, each letter is replaced by another letter, a number or a symbol, if each letter is replaced by only one cipher symbol, the method is considered monoalphabetic, like the Caesar method. Oh, I see. But nowadays, this method isn't very appropriate, is it? No, this method isn't very secure. The answer can be found within cryptanalysis. Excuse me Alice, I don't quite understand. What is cryptanalysis? Allow me to explain. Over the years, many people have tried to reveal the protected secrets without knowing the key with which they are encrypted. This field of study is called cryptanalysis and the people who perform them are cryptanalysts. Cryptology is the name of the science enclosing both cryptography and cryptanalysis. From the decline of the Roman Empire up to the Renaissance, cryptology only advanced significantly within the Islamic caliphates, especially with the Abbasid in their capital, Baghdad. Modern cryptanalysis was born in the 9th century, when they discovered that in each language, letters appeared with a different frequency, this way, they only had to count the number of times a symbol, letter or number appeared in a text, 
to know which letter it represented, regardless of its appearance. Now I understand why they say that monophobatic cipher isn't secure. Obviously, from that moment on, monophobetic ciphers were broken, and cryptanalysts had won the battle over cryptographers. Naturally, cryptographers couldn't disregard substitution methods making all cryptography rely only on transposition, so they developed the polyalphabetic ciphers. Does this mean that a more secure cryptographic method could be made using many different alphabets? to hide the frequency in which the letters appear. That's it. And it really isn't all that difficult. In polyalphabetic methods, each time a plain letter appears, it is replaced by an encrypted character be it a letter, a number or a symbol, from a limited range of characters. This way, a plain letter like a is sometimes replaced by X, but other times by Y or by the number 10, and always following a strict pattern, so there aren't any errors when deciphering. This way, the number of times a symbol appears in the text, can't give any useful information to the cryptanalyst. So, which were the most popular polyalphabetic systems? The methods that use this system were conceived by one of the most important figures of the Renaissance, Leon Battista Alberti, inventor of the first cipher device, the Alberti cipher disk. Also called formula, it was made up of two concentric disks. The inner disk had a low uppercase mixed alphabet for cipher text and was fixed, while the outer disk had one uppercase alphabet for plain text and could move around its center point. This way, each letter of the plain text alphabet corresponds to another letter of the cipher text alphabet, while being able to change this correspondence by sliding the outer ring. Therefore, it was a polyalphabetic method. Another popular system was the one created by Blaise the Vigener, based on a table in which you could read the intersection letter of the plain text with a key indicating which alphabet was being used. Alice, is it true? Then, that the consolidation of secret writing was an essential instrument of power in the creation of modern countries, communication between armies, and the presence of permanent embassies. Certainly, cipher secretaries were established, and they were responsible for ciphering the correspondence between kings, ministers and ambassadors, as well as cryptanalyze the correspondence intervened to other countries. In Spain, for example, the first known cipher secretary was Jerez the Almazan, appointed by the Catholic monarchs. But Philip II of Spain was the one to renew and greatly boost ciphering techniques by putting the cipher secretary Luis Vue de la Zorda in charge. He established a general cipher for communication between his secretaries, ambassadors, army officers and himself, and a personal cipher for communication between some of the aforementioned dignitaries and himself. Furthermore, for extra security, he would change frequently these ciphers. Did they use these methods of protection in other countries as well? Of course they did. They followed these methods in the other European kingdoms. For example, Walsingham with Elizabeth I of England and VT with Henry III and Henry IV of France both made cryptology an essential matter in European royal courts and embassies. I know there was a famous ciphering machine. When did the first ones appear? Although cryptology continued developing throughout modern and contemporary age, it isn't until the 20th century that we find substantial advances in ciphering techniques, so it is considered, in fact, the machine century. Being the Enigma machine the one that captured most of the attention, more than any of the other machines from past or present, Enigma was a cipher machine patented by Arthur Scorbius in 1918. It was used by the German army in 1923, which had several thousands of them during World War II where it played a very important role. That sounds familiar. The Germans tried out how the machine worked in battle during the Spanish Civil War, providing the nationalists with some devices. That's right. The history of this machine and its use is fascinating. We'll study it in detail later on. In fact, it is after World War II when the most significant theoretical advances in the history of cryptology take place. For example, in 1948, Claude Shannon, establishes the theoretical basics of cryptology, 
but that's another subject. Well, Alice, I think this is enough for today. Yes, you're right, Bob. We better continue this some other time. On the Entipedia website, you can find a document with additional information on this enthralling subject. See you at our next video. Goodbye. See you later.